does the Holy Spirit relate to all that we've been talking about here with our motive? First of all, we have to remember that the Holy Spirit is essential for our initial regeneration, that is, for the new birth. Remember that Scripture says that the ungodly cannot please God, they cannot do good. So if we're going to do good works, those which please God, we have to be born again. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings about this new birth, who gives us saving faith, who causes us to repent of sins, who causes us to fear God, and all the other things we've talked about. So the Holy Spirit is responsible for beginning this work in us. But second, the Holy Spirit not only does this initial work in us, but he also works in us continually. Notice Galatians 3.3, 3, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect in the flesh? The way Paul phrases this in the Greek, he implies a negative answer, that of course not, you're now being made perfect in the flesh. That is, Paul is saying that not only does our initial new life depend upon the Holy Spirit, but our continual Christian life depends on the Spirit as well. We cannot be sanctified by our own works, by our own strength. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit. So, what does the Spirit do for us? Well, he gives us a desire to repent and obey. He works in our hearts so that we see our sins and want to turn from them and want to do what is right and pleasing to God. And, as we saw when we talked about Scripture and the role of the Scripture in ethics, we know that the Holy Spirit enlightens us to understand and apply the Bible properly. Now, you all know of times when you've come across some passage of Scripture which you've read many times before, but you suddenly see a new application of it to a situation in your life. You know, this is not new revelation in the sense that God is speaking to you some special thing he hasn't previously revealed. No, it's always been there in Scripture all along. It's just that now the Holy Spirit enables you to see that passage better, to understand it more clearly, and he's enabled you to see how it applies to some situation that you're facing. Now, let's compare this as we think about our motives, compare it to existentialism, to the perspective of Jean-Paul Sartre and Soren Kierkegaard. There are some similarities to existentialism. After all, Sartre emphasized that our motive is important in our ethics. What we do must be done out of pure motives, just not just because someone is forcing us to do it. I mean, we've talked before about the example of you know, my walking down the street and I see some uh, poor fellow begging for money. Well, if I give him money because I want to impress the person that's next to me, or because uh, something like that, that that's my motive, then that is not a good work. Nobody would say that that's a good thing, that I gave that beggar money to impress somebody else. If that was my motive, then I didn't do a good work. So motives are important in ethics. And we're not doing a good work unless we do it willingly. You see, being forced to do something against our will is not good. I mean, if I give money to the poor beggar because my friend is holding a gun to my head and requiring me to do it, that's not a good work in our current context. If uh, I'm helping out the poor by the government forcibly taxing me and giving that money to the poor, I haven't done something good by that. I'm not willing at all. Okay, so that's important. So in this sense, existentialism, we, we have these similarities with existentialism, with Jean-Paul Sartre and Soren Kierkegaard. These were some points that they saw that are valid. But now there are important differences with existentialism as well. For one thing, our biblical motives must be grounded and defined by Scripture. My motives, the feelings I have, the heart desires I have, must be those which Scripture commands. I have to bring my internal heart attitudes into line with the Bible, and not just whatever attitude I freely express. Second, my heart attitudes must work themselves out in accord with scriptural standards. That is, it's not just that if I have the right feeling, 
whatever I do is good. You see, I have the right feeling, I have the right attitude, but I have to express that in the right way. We've already mentioned, okay, I can't say, well, I love my neighbor's wife so much that I'll commit adultery with her. I can't say, I love my children too much to punish them. No, Paul tells us in Romans 13.10 that love is the fulfillment of the law. That is, when we show true love, we'll do so in a way that keeps the law of God. I cannot allow my love to do whatever it wants. True love will always do what is in line with the law of God. Now, in the discussion post that follows, I'd like for you to think of some problem or behavior among your students and briefly describe it. No names, please. But think about how does what we've learned about our motives apply to that situation in your class? After all, a lot of what we've been talking about the last couple of years here at CCS about the culture of grace comes in here. You see, we're interested in reaching the heart the desire, the motives of our students. So, how might you apply a biblical teaching about motives to that situation in your class, or that problem that you're facing? Briefly summarize that in the post and respond to others who post to that as well.